Um, so um, Frederick will be um, giving the next talk about um, using Jiten in practice. So um, please welcome Frederick. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I will be talking about Jiten in practice and go through some examples. Um, will be quite high tempo, short on time, much content. Um, but I'll start just with an obligatory uh, bit about me. Uh, I'm a software contractor. I do lots of Python work. I've done lots of Java work. Uh, if you count the years and hours, I've definitely done more uh, Java work than uh, Python. Uh, and um, during the years, I've also used uh, Jython in corporate environments uh, for different reasons and different situations. Uh, and it seems that in the Python world, the option to do this is not that very known. So I've been trying to market it more or less as a way uh, of making your Java stack more enjoyable. Uh, but as uh, software developers, uh, all of you are, and nobody will remember me as a software developer, uh, the hook for remembering me is that I live on a boat. I am not a software developer, I'm a software developer who lives on a boat. Uh, and if you think that would be hard, you should also consider that this is the view from my office. <laughs> so, uh, the uh, archetypical um, Jython intro. You download the jar, you can run it, or if you run the installer, you just use Jython and you get a Python REPL, more or less. The main difference being that you also get the uh, JVM information when you start up. And you can do hello world. Uh, a little bit more interesting is that you can also import stuff directly from Java, and then you can print hello world again, more or less. Uh, and one thing that's really interesting, if you haven't seen it before, is that in this REPL, you have full introspection capabilities from Python into your Java code. Uh, and this means that you can actually actively use the REPL to, um, uh, to explore Java code. Uh, to me, this is a huge thing, because I spend lots of time in the REPL while doing uh, exploratory programming in the beginning of projects and so on. Um, and I basically would spend so much more time if I didn't have uh, introspection. Or, of course, Java has introspection, it's just nowhere near as convenient. So, my first example will be uh, the first time ever I go against the general wisdom and do a live, live demo uh, on stage. Because uh, doing servlets is sometimes useful because you can uh, kind of shortcut away the entire uh, edit, compile, test, deploy loop that you get when you do servlets. Uh, and it's also really, really convenient. Uh, so I will show you how much work needs to be done. I have downloaded the latest version of Tomcat. I've also downloaded the latest version of Jython and put the jar into uh, the lib folder uh, of Tomcat and started the server. Uh, and then I've created a new servlet. How many have used, uh, have created servlets? Yeah, okay, that's quite a few actually. Uh, so the only thing I've done is create a folder with a web inf, which is the configuration for servlets, if you don't know. And I've created a very small web XML. This is basically ripped right out, out of the Jython documentation. Because Jython comes shipped with a, this Py servlet which basically is the only thing you need uh, to do uh, Java compliant servlets. And then we just set up mappings that says uh, all the Py files, pass them to this servlet. And then to implement the actual servlet uh, is as easy as creating a class with, the, well, we have do get here, so it's do post, do delete, so on, uh, which gets request and response objects, and you write output, you set headers, uh, just like you would in uh, Java land, but you do it in Python. Uh, so this is all that needs to be done. Those two files are working Python code in, uh, yeah, okay, so it doesn't change, so let's, uh, this is Sparta. Uh, and if we reload the page, this is Sparta. 
This is a bit faster than deploying to um, enterprise Java applications normally, especially if you go beyond uh, Tomcat. Uh, and the other thing is that's worth noting here, I won't go into more detail here because this is so simple that it's not needed, is that if we do something... Um, sorry. Yeah? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, of course. Um, I thought so. I don't... I have crashed my... Actually, I think I just broke Sublime. Should have used uh, some other. Uh, let's see. No, it doesn't work. Um, okay, so I can't for some reason. Uh, but, but what I wanted to show was uh, there is no error function. I can't hear what you're saying. Sorry. Uh, I don't actually have the time. Sorry. Uh, but I introduced a syntax error into the code. And what I wanted to show you is that even if it's in the Python code, we have syntax errors, we get perfectly understandable stack traces. Jython is actually really good at that. You do get the Java stack trace, which is this part. But on top of it, uh, you have a same uh, Python error message when you, do, um, uh, when you have syntax errors or any other runtime errors. Uh, and this is really convenient because not all uh, FFI calls gives you this much information. Um, so I will not talk more about servlets because they're so easy. However, embedding Jython is a more general case. Uh, you want to do something complicated in Java, which is simple in Python. For me, this has been mainly operating system integration because to do the same things you can do out of the box with the Python standard library will often have you download lots and lots of files uh, or in third-party libraries uh, to do conveniently in Java. Uh, you can also embed uh, Jython for, to be able to do rapid prototyping, which is one of the first things I ever did with Jython. Uh, and it's a bit more complicated than doing it the other way around. Calling Java from Jython is uh, as natural as writing Python, but calling Python from Java, if you do read the tutorials, they show you some really simple ways of doing it, which you will then have to replace. So this would be your typical uh, FFI wrapping code, uh, where you need to actually take care of getting the types right uh, from Java. So what you can see here is that uh, we create a module to wrap the Python code when we instantiate it, or a class, rather. Um, when we instantiate it, we create a new Python interpreter. We execute the imports in it to pull the uh, Python code into that interpreter, and then we get a pointer uh, to the Py function um, so that we can call it. And as you can see that when we do call it, uh, we use the uh, down there call because any pi object can be called. We could have used invoke, I suppose, instead here. Uh, but this would be the general case. And we need to tell them what types we send and we need to tell them what types we want to return, of course, because this is, this is Java land. Um, and of course, we need overloading and so on uh, if we want to handle different types. And if we compile this file and then run it, yeah, it gives you the square of 2 and 2.2. Uh, yeah, so the Python part of this has no Java specifics at all, actually. So run it. Uh, but everybody does this example, more or less, when they do FFI, demonstrate FFI, uh, Py, um, uh, C types, for example, has this called time thing, because that's easy. It gets complicated when you're trying to do some stuff with arrays and uh, custom data types and so on, and that's also the case with Jython. Uh, so the first thing I ever did in uh, Jython was uh, this, a bit more complicated, with path, uh, path optimizations, prototyping. And calling, throwing the arrays into 
Python. Really simple. Getting the results out in a convenient way is trickier. As you can see here, uh, I don't get an array back. I get an iterator over pi objects, which I then need to individually cast or um, maybe wrap in uh, something else to make it easily accessible from a proper Java perspective. Uh, so normally you would want to use uh, some kind of uh, callback so that you actually push data from Jython into Java instead of trying to return complex values. Uh, I'll show you one way of doing this when we talk about scripting. Uh, adding scripting to Java is uh, possibly easier than uh, straight up embedding and it's a really convenient way to add uh, scripting because Jython is so easy to integrate. So if we want to allow a user or administrator or whoever who is not doing our uh, Java coding the ability to make a choice in this case. Uh, we can allow them to supply a Python code. This could as easily just be a source file or sent over the wire or whatever. Give me the script file. And again, we import it. Of course, we, if we had the source file in another way, we could just tell to execute all of this, this entire string, which could be all of our Python code. Uh, and then we can call it. And this is one way of doing the, uh, that I'm showing here, is that instead of trying to get a return value from the Jython call, because the Jython, call to Jython will always return a pi object, which can be anything, and uh, the, the ways of casting that into the proper type uh, is either uh, complex or expensive. So what we do instead is that we let the Python side know about where to put the answer. So we actually do a call, to get the answer, and then we return um, with this scripting decision, which is just a static in this case to make the example even simpler. And the Python code imports uh, the scripting class and uh, makes the choice and puts the, uh, puts the answer there. So using a callback uh, pattern, not to achieve uh, asyn uh, asynchronous behavior, but to uh, use the fact that it's easier to call into Java from Jython than the other way around. So if we run this, uh, it works. So you can add anything in there um, and it will work. Uh, and the last way I'll talk about using Jython is using Jython as a test bed. And this is the way we use Jython today a lot. Um, some code is really hard to test well. And some things are becomes really verbose when writing them in Java. So for our specific uh, perspective, we have uh, Java micro edition code running on several different versions of hardware. Uh, and we need to test this code, uh, or rather we need to test the application for uh, resilience and fault tolerance. Uh, and sure, we have unit tests, but they tell us the obvious things. Uh, this function doesn't work the way we intended it to. It doesn't tell us what will happen if the GSM networks starts to report out of bounds values. Uh, and first we were trying to kind of extend our unit tests into some kind of functional test things in Java. But we ended up with so much code that we got this, uh, I suppose anyone who's been in the industry long enough have seen when you have the test cases are actually freezing the design because you have so many tests and so much mocking that if you change anything, the tests break, even though nothing really broke. Uh, so we decided to do it in another way. We have uh, in Java land, this uh, device handler, which basically lies right on top of the metal and um, lets us ignore that we have different firmware versions and slightly different uh, hardware and so on. So we create a, in Python, we create a class factory, which creates classes derived from uh, this device handler, and we supply it with some same defaults. Uh, and then we supply it with some default implementations of uh, calls to the hardware layer. So if you call beep, it will print beep to the console instead, for example. Uh, and th this um, 
way we have a hardware mock which lets the application run and not do anything useful. It stores data, it uh, records, uh, I haven't shown any here, but some calls are recorded so we can introspect this device handler object in the end. And we also added uh, these small snippets so that we can, for every test, we can get a new, um, a new class specified for that test and replace some of the methods that we're interested in for that test. So the way we use this is that this is a real test that we have. We need to test that the auto update. This is one of the very simplest tests we have. Uh, that if the uh, auto update uh, succeeds and it gets a, a uh, version number that's higher than the current version number, it should trigger an update. So what we do is this uh, get via HTTP connection is a way to get a string from a uh, string contents of a URL, which is used throughout the application. So for this specific uh, version, we just say return crap if we don't recognize the URL, because the application should uh, keep on running anyway. But if anyone's asking for the required version uh, from the REST API, uh, then always return 999.99. .99. So we create, use our factory to create a new device handler with this uh, newly created uh, replacement function or method, really. Uh, then we set the um, update rate to twice a second, just to make it fast. And we run the entire application, which means the application boots, runs self-tests, and runs for three seconds and then shuts down. And then we use uh, the, the um, then we just check the device handler object that that method had been called that we were expecting. And of course, this, this is a very simple example. We do the same with in, instead say, okay, what happens if we run the application and then the um, uh, connection to the server hangs and when we're trying to run the, uh, to um, reboot the uh, GSM modem, it returns out of bounds values. Because that's an error case we have had once, and trying to test that without actually being able to run the entire code and do introspection on it is really hard. Uh, and on the matter of finding weird behaviors and bugs, this, um, the mock uh, data handlers we create, or device handlers we create, uh, together with the repo, allows us to explore the behaviors of our application as it is running. Because we can basically just start the application. This um, uh, application object is a, a Java micro edition midlet. That's what's running here. Uh, so it's a multi-threaded application. It has checks, uh, several, it has actually so many simple behaviors that it's a really complex application. Uh, and we can just start it and at the command line start, okay, giving it an SMS, uh, break this, um, replace that, and see what happens. So that when we have really weird logs of things that shouldn't be able to happen, uh, we can start by trying to explore the behavior of our application in runtime and see how can we trigger these faulty behaviors. And this is extremely valuable when you have a domain where you don't really control. I mean, we control everything right down until the network starts. And then we control nothing. Um, and the J2ME application, um, the J2ME uh, runtimes are buggy. And the GSM specification isn't as good as you'd think. So different GSM networks behave differently. And this gives us the ability to see uh, we can, since we can't control that, we have to be able to make sure that our application can handle basically anything gracefully and not just die or something. Uh, so this is, um, and this of course also gives uh, with, um, uh, since we do this in Python, it's really easy to add some fast testing. We just add, s send random data as response to queries <laughs> and so on, just to see what happens to our application when things don't behave the way it should. Um, and last, a little bit short. Uh, I've seen good and bad examples of using Jython. Uh, the thing is that adding a new language is not free. And when people want to add 
they found, just found Python. Ah, let's add Python to our stack. And you have this huge Java um, enterprise stack. It's really easy to just slip in another jar because, let's face it, there's already 200 jars in there, so that works fine. The problem is that when you do that, as soon as anything breaks, it will be Python's fault, and everybody will hate Python and you forever. Uh, so the thing is that I've actually tried to use this as an argument. It worked so-so. It's more fun than writing all of these things in uh, Java. So that, that, that didn't really work. And then was the fact where we had OS integration, and we said basically we, we need to download like 15 packages. Or we can add the Jython jar and have it just one extra dependency. The problem is that Java architects are really used to having lots and lots of dependencies, so they, they're beyond caring. Oh, just download Maven Central everything and make it work. So there's actually only one single argument that has been working for me in corporate environments. I can do this in half a day, or I can give it to you in a month or so. So this is the golden thing that, but it also means that you need to actually first know how to integrate Jython, because otherwise you'll spend five days in doing the integration. But as I have shown, I hope, it's really easy to get started. Um, and once you have the wrapping, you can really, really supercharge your uh, Java stack development time. And of course, sometimes you have performance issue, issues uh, or some other aspects, but for general prototyping and testing especially, I think it's, there are very many gains to be had from this. And I am out of time. So I don't know if we have time for questions, maybe one or two. Um, yeah, that's four minutes uh, for questions. So. Hey, thanks for the talk. So I'm a really fan of the JVM and I'm a fan of Python. Um, and it's a little bit sad that Jiten lags behind in uh, many places. So um, my first question would be, what's, um, you showed many things, for example, the surflet and so on. Sorry, can you? The surflets, for example, yeah. which are dynamic. Uh, what's the benefit of using Python uh, over the um, JVM languages like Ruby, Scala, Clojure? They're also, um, yeah. you can... Um, I, I would say that I, I would use uh, Python instead of uh, Scala because I know Python a lot better. I wouldn't say that it's uh, inherently better uh, than any of the other alternative uh, languages on the JVM. Uh, and in some ca cases, like uh, Clojure, especially, I'd say that for some cases it's definitely worse. On the other hand, it's easier to get a hold of a Java program than a Lisp programmer, basically. Uh, I, I would, uh, I've used uh, some other languages on the JVM as well, and I would normally say that that's a choice depending on the competence of the teams or the organization you're working in, more than the technical merits of the language, actually. I just have a second one. Um, did you run a, a purely Python program with Jiten anywhere? Uh, like, sorry. Did, did you run a pure Python program with Jiten anywhere, like in production or for test tooling or something. So what I mean is like having the power of JVM, but for just um, having the power for uh, I have I have used it to run, uh, um, to run a threaded concurrency, because it's faster on the JVM than it is in CPython. Uh, which one, sorry? Uh, when you do uh, CPU intensive multi-threading, okay. uh, the JVM is actually a lot faster because uh, you can sidestep the JIL issues entirely. But that's the only case I've actually done pure Python programming in Jython. Otherwise, it's always been an issue of integration with uh, something existing on the JVM already. Yeah, I tried, for example, to do exactly this. So I had a small Jerry Pi, Jerry Pi Hello World app and just benchmarked it with Jython and CPython, and it performed worse than Jython, even though it has uh, with concurrency, of course. Um, so yeah. it was a, I was, it was a little bit disappointing to see Jiten perform so bad. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, there. There is a performance impact, of course, and uh, so I think that the only times that you actually can say that it will be faster is that if if the Jill is actually your problem, which it's mostly not, then 
uh, this is one solution uh, to that. Uh, but I haven't, I don't think you should expect better performance. Um, so, yeah, uh, we've run out of time now, so um, thanks again for, to Frederick for the talk. I'll be available.